Thank you all for coming. Um, so uh, my name is Denny. Uh, I've been doing uh, Python uh, development for a couple of years now, uh, mostly uh, web development uh, and uh, some uh, tooling and, and uh, CLIs. Uh, I also do a lot of uh, sysadmin DevOps stuff and I like to automate uh, as much as I can. Uh, I work for a small uh, Python shop based in Uh, you probably already use uh, a full-blown VM like VirtualBox and, uh, uh, and possibly Vagrant and stuff like that. Uh, the most important thing to me uh, is uh, that containers are fast. So starting a container is uh, measured in uh, milliseconds. Uh, most of the time you can start uh, hundreds and hundreds of containers. Uh, and th that's all because there is a minimal overhead um, because uh, containers share the same kernel uh, and therefore it's much easier to uh, access uh, resources like disk, network, etc. Uh, also, um, uh, images aren't copied for every container uh, that we run from them. Rather, uh, like I said, containers use, uh, containers only save uh, diffs to disk. Uh, this is due to a technology called UnionFS. Uh, so all of this should make it easy to run uh, your whole production stack uh, locally uh, and you should do that because it's very important for everybody on the team, for every work workstation to have um, the, same, uh, the same versions of libraries and databases uh, and everything on, on every workstation uh, and this goes all the way down to, to C libraries. So how, how do we run a container? We use the docker run command. We say with the T flag uh, which base or parent image to use and we supply a command to run. Uh, the I flag denotes that we want to run it interactively that, so we don't want the process to go into the background whereas uh, if we supply the D flag, uh, we are gonna run the con uh, container in the background and notice that we didn't have to supply a command here because the command was uh, because the command uh, was baked uh, into the image and it's only overridden if a uh, user supplies another command. You can also use uh, tags uh, to um, have different versions of your images for, for example, to denote uh, versions of your database and so on. So uh, you, would use, uh, you would use Docker PS command to, uh, to list the, all the running uh, containers that you have on your machine. Um, that shows you, among other things, the container ID, which you can then supply to the logs command to get the logs that your uh, service is, is, is writing to standard output. Uh, you can also use stop, kill, and start commands uh, to uh, restart the container, stop it, or kill it. Uh, so by default, the stop command sends a term signal to the process inside the container, but it has a default uh, timeout, after which it sends the, sends the kill signal. So, so uh, that's a little bit about containers. Uh, now we're gonna talk about images. Um, basically, you can build images manually and when I talk about images, I don't mean base images like uh, the Debian image that we saw before. I mean your images that are gonna be based on a parent image like uh, image for Postgres or, um, or a cache or something like that. So you would, so you would run a bash prompt interactively from a, from a Debian image, for instance. You would type in your commands to install your services, configure them, and whatnot. Uh, then you would grab the ID uh, with the Docker PS command, uh, and then you would, you would commit that container to a new image. So the commit command creates a new image. You can then use the Docker tag command to uh, tag that image uh, with a version, perhaps, or s something, something else. You can also rename it, give it another name. Uh, so the username prefix is important for uh, for pushing to the to the central hub. So as I said, a hub is a is a hosted central repository of private and public images. Uh, the um, the images that aren't prefixed with the username are um, um, maintain, maintain images maintained by the core team. Uh, images uh, done by the community are prefixed with a username and you need to, before you can push uh, an image uh, to the central repository to be able to share it, you need to log in to the, to the hub. So that was, that was a way to manually build your images. A better way is to use Docker files. So it's a, it's a small DSL that you would use uh, to, describe, um, uh, to describe what 
uh, what files to add to the uh, to the image, uh, what commands to run, uh, and what uh, ports to expose. Also, uh, you supply uh, the baked-in command to run if if no other co uh, command is supplied uh, via the command line, and you just use the Docker build command. Uh, to point it to the directory where the Docker file is located, and you name name your image, and it will build the image for you. Uh, so uh, most of you are probably thinking about uh, what do I do on a Mac? Because uh, Docker uh, requires um, a Linux kernel. Uh, so uh, a Docker is uh, it consists of a Docker daemon, which is basically just a HTTP API. Uh, and the Docker CLI, the command line interface that I just showed, just talks to that HTTP API. Uh, uh, having that in mind, uh, there's a helper application called boot to docker which is the official way to run Docker on, on Mac, which basically uses VirtualBox and sets everything up. Uh, basically uses VirtualBox and sets everything up uh, on your Mac, so you can use the CLI to communicate with the Docker process running in the, in the VirtualBox instance. Um, okay, so th those were the those were the basics uh, of how how you would uh, use Docker to manipulate images and containers. But how does that help you in your uh, development environment? Um, it's really important to run uh, uh, to run uh, services and the same version of services that you run in production locally. So that way, you always know if something works on your workstation that it should work on uh, that it should work on production as well. So you eliminate eliminate a lot of bugs, not just between workstation and production, but between two workstations. So what we have here is an instance of running. Uh, an example of running a, a Postgres database. Uh, so we expose, so we expose the default port that the container exposes, and we map it to the to the same port uh, on the host, so we can connect to it fr from the host. Uh, if we didn't supply a host port, uh, Docker would generate one for us and configure all the port forwarding and, and whatnot. Uh, also, uh, containers uh, themselves are ephemeral, which means which means that. Uh, when you start a container, you write some files, then you stop it and run another container from that image. Uh, the, cha the changes that you did in the last container are gone. This is because the, uh, the image is itself is immutable and you just started the new container from point zero. So, uh, this is troublesome if we want to run a database because we want to um, save our tables and our uh, database data. Uh, and the way to uh, to deal with this is to use uh, to use volumes, uh, and we tell it to mount the host directory uh, in the, inside the container in the place where uh, the database is going to write the data. So every time we run another container, uh, we'll still have our database data uh, retained. Uh, this is there's another another slightly more portable way, which is to have. Uh, one container for your data, uh, which doesn't even actually have to run for this uh, to work. So one container for your data that exposes a volume, and then we use the volumes from flag to mount that uh, folder, that data folder inside the running container that actually runs the Postgres process. Um, I like the host version more uh, for my development environment, at least, because I like to um, run the clean command a lot, so I delete most of the stopped containers, and this way I don't have to worry about deleting my test database data. So I've shown examples of how to run uh, services in a container, but what's the uh, benefit of running your uh, web app in a container? So basically you simplify, uh, simplify the runtime a lot. You make sure that every, everyone on the team uses the same uh, version of all the dependencies. This is something that uh, virtual land should be for in, in the Python world at least, but this isn't true for uh, C libraries. As everybody knows that's uh, ever tried to compile the, uh, install the Python imaging library, so you would, you mostly saw warnings at the end that uh, told you that some image formats aren't, aren't supported. Uh, and basically this eliminates that problem. So, so you don't have stuff working on, on one workstation and not working on another because of missing C libraries. Uh, also, uh, an added benefit is that you can use links. Links is a feature uh, that Docker provides for uh, letting containers talk to each other in a way. Uh, so you would start, you would name and start your Postgres container, uh, and you would uh, use the link flag to link that Postgres container uh, with, with this name inside your web app container, uh, which means that, um, which, ba which basically does um, 
uh, allows the J Django uh, app container to uh, be able to communicate uh, with the Postgres container via the, the host name provided here. Uh, also, uh, it exports a lot of um, environment variables, uh, ports and IP addresses and whatnot, so you can use that uh, to, uh, to bake those um, environment variables in your Django settings file or whatnot. Um, so how, how do you uh, automate all of this? Because not, uh, presumably not everybody, everyone on the team needs to, needs to know how to run Docker. Uh, I use make files a lot, so I uh, built a lot of uh, targets or make commands uh, for running each, uh, uh, each service. Uh, so just a one-liner command to run a Postgres database or a queue or whatnot. Uh, and uh, I also have um, commands that can bring up the whole uh, development environment uh, for that particular project. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, bash scripts and, and make files aren't enough. Uh, so remember I said that the Docker daemon is just an HTTP API. So there's uh, a project called Docker Py. Uh, the, it's the official Python wrapper for that, that, that API. Um, it's available uh, on PyPI, and it lets you do, uh, I think, all of the all of the things that you can do on the command line interface. And there are other wrappers in other languages, but to my knowledge, this is the most com complete one. I, I could be wrong, but I think it's so. Um, so it lets you you could you could write you could write in pure Python uh, your whole script for for uh, bringing up your whole development environment. Um, so, but what if you use if you use uh, Ansible or uh, Chef or Puppet or any other of the provisioning tools? Uh, you can basically use uh, use both of them uh, together. So, an example, an Ansible example would be that you could use the, a Docker file to uh, just bootstrap the environment that Ansible needs to run, and then run your playbook uh, to provision a database inside that image. Another option. Uh, uh, another option is to uh, is to have um, uh, Ansible or Puppet or Chef connect to uh, to a um, to the local IP address of of the container. Uh, but this is uh, bad because um, uh, for that to work, you need to have um, uh, SSHD or another agent running inside the container. Uh, for for uh, the provisioning tool to be able to communicate with it, uh, and to, for that to work, you also need a, some kind of supervisor, uh, which um, which can be upstart or a system D or supervisor D, uh, which would uh, which would allow you uh, allow you to run multiple processes inside the same container. Uh, this is uh, this isn't considered best practice. Uh, so Docker advises you to run uh, one process per container. Uh, so it's a lot easier to update just one component of your system or uh, just um, um, not, not update it, but possibly change it for another component. So for instance, if you had SSHD in there, uh, uh, if there is an SSL vulnerability, you basically need to update that, uh, that whole container, uh, which you might have, uh, which you possibly could avoid it if, if you didn't have that process running uh, in there. Um, also, there's, a, uh, there's another project called uh, FIG. Uh, the best way to uh, describe FIG uh, is um, as Vagrant for, for Docker. Uh, so what Vagrant does for VirtualBox, uh, in my, in my mind, Fig, uh, Fig does for, for Docker. Uh, you can describe, you, you use YAML syntax, and you can describe uh, how, to, how to build your images, what ports uh, to expose, uh, what, uh, to which container uh, to uh, link your web app container. Uh, it also supports uh, down, automatically downloading images uh, from, uh, from the central hub. Uh, and with one command, you can basically have a swarm of containers uh, running without uh, without the rest of the team needing to know how uh, the internals of how this works. Um, also, I, I read like an hour ago that uh, Fig is becoming part of Docker, so 
there's probably going to be some interesting development there. Uh, it was announced on their, uh, on their blog. Um, so in summary, um, you sh I hope I, I've convinced you that you should uh, run your production stack in development environment because uh, it's def Docker makes it easy. Uh, not, all, not all of the team need to, need to be able to install all these services on their, on their uh, workstations. Uh, you use the same environment everywhere, uh, not just uh, uh, worksta workstation versus production, but uh, uh, on all of the workstations. Uh, and uh, it should make your um, uh, upgrade uh, process more, uh, uh, more, more easy because you can easily, uh, easily rip, up, uh, rip out uh, one part uh, and uh, change it with like an updated version or a, or a different process. Uh, and uh, this all happens transparently to your team. They, they don't need to know that a new image has been pulled uh, from the central rep repository, it just works. Uh, also, I didn't talk about deployment in this talk because I don't have enough time. Uh, but um, uh, using Docker uh, in this way uh, uh, really simplifies deployment. Uh, because uh, it enables you to bring in new team members on a project more easily. So imagine that uh, you or your DevOps person uh, have set up the production using all of these images, and all you need to do uh, to be able to uh, bring a new person up to speed while, while set up their development environment is uh, supply, supply them with the images that you're already running in production, and they, they don't need to do any, uh, any other setup. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Questions? We do have um, a few minutes for questions. Um, and there's the microphone at the back if you want to walk up to it. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Uh, as you're doing Django development, uh, I was wondering, do you include the Django application code inside your Docker images, or do you keep it separated? Uh, so it depends on the project. Uh, some, uh, some projects uh, aren't uh, run inside a, a container because they're simple by themselves. We just use the supporting services in containers, like a, a database, a queue. Uh, but other, uh, other projects uh, have a Docker file committed uh, in the repo, and on deploy, uh, uh, you just rebuild that Docker file to have the latest version of your source repository inside an image. OK, so you include the code inside the, the Docker image. Yeah, you use, you use the add command in the Docker file to include the uh, uh, directory with the code inside, uh, inside the Docker image. Great, thank you. I've got one question, which is probably very stupid. Uh, how do you edit uh, code inside a repository inside a Docker file, a Docker container? So uh, you would uh, you would uh, use volumes for that. So you can uh, mount uh, your working directory uh, inside a running container in a known path. So when you uh, edit the code on your local machine, it's automatically visible inside the runtime, inside the Docker container. That makes perfect sense. Uh, another, um, another question, usually you can't use uh, the central repository for anything other, other than uh, public uh, stuff. Uh, what do you do with your own builds or with your own applications? Where do you, uh, your own data, where you, uh, can you somehow put that into a custom or your private own private yeah. central repository? So, so the, the hub does allow for private reposit repositories, but it's not a, it's not a free feature. Uh, but there's an open source uh, component that's called uh, the registry, which you can install, which is uh, which is Python powered. You can install uh, on your server, and you can use that for pushing your private images. Uh, also, uh, sometimes if it's if it's a small image, maybe you don't need to rebuild. Uh, maybe you don't need to have it deployed on a um, on a central hub, but you can just rebuild it on deploy. Uh, depends on your use case. Yes, the problem is uh, 
for example, with European regulations, you wouldn't be allowed to trust uh, to trust the Docker central repository with quite a few of uh, what you would want to put there. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hi, quick question. Do you have any tips about the automated deployment from continuous integration? Like uh, you have always your master uh, branch, which is deployable, and then you deploy uh, automatically from to, to production from that master. And do you have any tips like build though build images or not build images? Just uh, do it on the fly on the servers. What's the best practice for that? Because I'm struggling with that right now. How to do it like perfectly? Uh, I'm I'm not sure there is a best practice yet. <laughs> uh, so how do you do? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of solutions that don't necessarily. Uh, uh, work uh, the same way in the sense that you can, if you get tired of one, that you can use another. Uh, that's that's something that the uh, Docker team is trying to fix, I think, with uh, introdu with an introduction with a new library. Uh, but the most simplest way I th I think uh, that you can accomplish that is uh, basically just have a deploy trigger. Uh, on GitHub or whatever, if the if the build passes, to uh, trigger the server to just rebuild uh, the new image uh, with uh, uh, with a new tag, so the latest version. You can and then you switch your uh, load balancing software uh, or proxy software like Nginx or whatever to point to that new image. Uh, that way, if it doesn't work, you can just switch back to the to the old one. Okay, so spawning new one, new new uh, new Docker container. If it's yeah. it's fine, yeah. then okay, persistive, and the yeah. other ones like going down. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thank you. I think that's unfortunately all the question time we okay. have. But you can find Denny outside if you yeah. want to ask him. Um, if we can just thank Denny again. Thanks. <laughs>